And we're back with Off the Press with uh, our, our guest today, Judge Corey Woodward. Thanks for coming again. And uh, and also I have my uh, co-host. I'm James Berger with Bakersfield, Californian, uh, and uh, my co-host Russ Johnson, uh, and he's a government affairs uh, consultant here in town. And our uh, illustrious uh, uh, Nicole Para, who is faculty out at uh, Cal State Bakersfield, having fun in her new classes this <laughs> this new s- first year of semester for the how, how many students right now? I have a small class, sixty. With the semester wow. system, they've limited the classes to about sixty, and uh, but the classes are shorter, an hour and fifteen minutes. And sp- can you imagine me trying to teach in an hour and fifteen minutes for a class? It's tough, especially this wow. presidential year. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, but it's fun. Yeah. It'll yeah. it's good. Yeah, definitely. So, um, uh, we've been talking about what it means to be a, a judge uh, for Mr. Woodward. And uh, I, I think uh, that kind of the adapting to a, a, such a diverse court out there is definitely interesting. Um, Russ, you had a, a, th- a couple of thoughts I think you wanted to y- delve into. Yeah, we, we had your opponent in here, and we asked her the same question. And every attorney I know always has that one case, right? It's that one case that sticks with you for some reason. Maybe it was your first one. Maybe it was your... Tenth one, maybe it was your hundredth one, or maybe it was just the topic was uh, just stuck with you for forever. And maybe it was something that while you were a DA, maybe it was something while you were um, on the bench. But what's that one case that you remember that just you can't put out of your head? Yeah, <coughs> there's two, and I, I guess there's th- they're both. One would be a criminal, and one would be the civil side. And um, let me let me talk about the the civil. It was actually a family law case that uh, was involved. In family law, you can imagine the emotions run very high, and then it makes it very very easy to make accusations. And one of the most delicate situations that we're ever in is when when there's a an accusation of child molestation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, in the, and of course, in many cases, those are very very hard to prove. If they were easy to prove, they, there'd be a criminal case criminal case would be proceeding and and you'd have a pretty good answer uh, on uh, on the question that's presented but sometimes it's just uh, as simple as this is the accusation that is being made and so you know th- there's a general procedure that we follow the thing that made this a little more um, compelling was the uh, the individual uh, was a law enforcement officer and that um, that w- of course, that meant, uh, first of all, there's the accusation he ended up being arrested. The, uh, uh, of course, there's, compl- there's obviously com- significant complications in that man's life. Uh, he was s- put on a, what do they call it, a suspen- not a suspension, but m- administrative leave, maybe that's what mm-hmm. it was. But of course, you can't have your, uh, he can't have his gun or anything like that. But, but so this guy comes in, he's adamant that it doesn't happen, and there's very little proof that w- that th- uh, that it happened and so uh, and this went on for a period of time the case because you'll continue it because you'll get some input say for example from uh, a, a child witness investigator or you get reports law enforcement reports that come in so then ultimately w- it actually went to a trial on the issue and uh, it included a child uh, uh, interview from the the diamond the diamond center and when I listened to the story of the young girl, it, it, was, uh, uh, it was incredible, I, I guess you'd say. And when I say incredible, it got to the point where it was really not credible because so many, she, uh, there was accusations of so many things uh, that this man did. And, it, and I remember writing the opinion out is that had, this, had these things, all of the things that this young lady, is, young girl has said happened, uh, there would be some evidence. Somebody would have some evidence somewhere. And uh, so ultimately, wh- I made the decision that, uh, that I didn't believe that it happened, and the um, visitation goes back to normal. And you have to realize, as a judge, y- you know, you're sitting there thinking, I, you know, knowing how hard it is w- when, uh, well, no, how easy it is to make an accusation, how easy it is to make a denial, and without that proof, you know, you're, you're just you're using that best judgment, and you know, you're praying, Lord, give me wisdom here mm-hmm. about this. And then so, um, 
it, and then it ended up, uh, so anyway, it, the visitation came back, and then I would say within, probably within three months, the uh, mother was back in with another kind of an accusation that was made. This one, of course, it meant husbands getting arrested and suspended, and then ultimately uh, there were no criminal cases there wa that was filed. Uh, it was just uh, couldn't be filed, couldn't be proven, and so it, it ended up meaning a complete switch of custody where I was restricting the mother's uh, uh, custody and visitation rights at that time. And it was just probably one of the most difficult cases um, in, ter in deciding because the stakes are, are, are great, they're significant. And then, um, I don't know, it was probably, maybe it was six years, maybe about five or six years later, the girl was no longer nine, but she was 17. And there was somebody that relayed the information to me that this young gal said, it was all made up. You know, my mom had been directing uh, my testimony, uh, uh, my story. And of course, she was only nine at the time. And so it's one that is, has really sticks in my mind. And, it, uh, and it's because accusations are, are easy to make, and particularly child molestation. Y you know, it's <laughs> interesting. In the world that Nicole and I kind of come from, and the world that James covers, and you know, this is the political season, and one of our guests last week actually was talking about rhetoric. And he said, you know, rhetoric, 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 it's really all just kind of surrounding the campaign. And then when it gets done, people come back and they get to work. But in your case, rhetoric um, isn't rhetoric. Words actually mean something. And, you know, in, in a judge and legal field, it's, it's a totally different mm -hmm. perspective. No, absolutely. One thing. Um, one of the things that we always, or the basic principles that I try to explain when we're picking juries is it's very, very, very easy to have an opinion. Everybody knows if you're a drunk driver, uh, okay, it's wrong. You should be punished for being a drunk driver. Or if you have molested a child, it's wrong. You should be punished. You should be sh sanctioned for, for those, those actions. Um, <coughs> So those things are very, very easy, but one of the, what we have to protect against, and that is, is taking those, what I call street opinions. You know, everybody has a street opinion. Sure. Whatever it is, man on the street, <laughs> here you are. What's your opinion about this? And, you, and you, you, you give opinion whether you know anything about it or not. And then you have, but there's a different opinion, and that's the, the, that's the legal opinion or the jury's legal opinion based upon what happens. And, and it's, uh, sometimes it's a very difficult concept for people to distinguish. Okay, I, uh, I, wh what do you mean? Because you are dealing with confidence in police officers, confidence in the system, and well, the person sitting there wouldn't be there. And uh, what you, so you, th that is, ends up being a very, um, it, it's a, an issue probably in every jury trial that we have. But what I finally end up, and what I've learned over the, over the years, particularly with juries there, very, very intelligent. You know what, when you start out in the DA's office, uh, you're being trained to be an aggressive, uh, 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 aggressive lawyer. Uh, and you, so there's always jokes about the jury. And, and at one time, people would refer to jurors as 12 rocks in a box. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it was a complete lack, well, it was a complete lack of respect for the jury. But the thing really is it's a complete, uh, immaturity or, or indication of an immaturity and then as so as time grew and as I as a DA would grow but suddenly you realize wow those jurors are very very smart and and it's it's only grown my appreciation for jurors has only grown as a judge because you realize hey if this case is weak uh, y you're not going to see a conviction out of it and if it's strong um, there's going to be a conviction there so I have a Great deal of faith in the jury. Uh, one of the fascinating subjects that I like mm -hmm. teaching my students, obviously, Article Three, the judiciary, and we go through, um, uh, you know, Supreme Court cases and also the selection of Supreme Court justices and, and when we have vacancies like we do now, and then turning into localizing that for them with studying cases by Earl Warren and you know his role as an attorney general, governor, and then a Supreme Court justice. And you know his entry into law, um, some folks say, started when his father was killed here in Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious to see, I always like to talk to um, judicial folks, who were some of your early idols or role models that you saw because I know when I was in law school, you know, I, I had, you know, you know, the folks that I admired and wanted to 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 
you know, be like? Who was that for you when you were in law school and even now when you're looking at um, how they handled, especially some controversial decisions or controversies in their own personal life? Um, it's funny. Uh, when you talk about it, I immediately start thinking of people that may not be in the legal field right. that were significant and then people that were in, in, in significant. And um, uh, pro probably one, one of the, the earliest uh, uh, people, it was my tennis coach in high school. Hmm. And it, uh, as I think about him, here was a guy, he was short and he was roly-poly. And he, he's not someone who is out there telling you how to hit you to refine your forehand or your backhand and that sort of thing. But he he encouraged he encouraged you constantly and, and nonstop. And as I look back, I said that was the genius of that man. And he's out there playing with us, and we're always laughing because the guy can hardly move. He's got a knee brace on, yeah. but it was that that just that love that he had for the kids. And I, I to this day I, I continue to go back and th and think about how he had a general love for for people and his kindness and his and his happiness then uh, a few years later after i graduated from college knew i was going to law school um i started uh, just going to the lawyers uh, offices in barstow and you know you talk i look back and think Corey, you were stupid what were you thinking going because i was going there and saying uh, is there anybody, I want to go to law school, is there anything that I can do? Can I do some legal research or something like that for you? And uh, eventually there was, there was an attorney, and his name was Henry Kraft. He was a city attorney for Barstow, he was a city attorney for Victorville eventually, and then he had a private practice. And he took me on, and, and uh, you know, I still, I look back and say, why in the world did you do that? And he, believe this or not, so one day he tells me a dirty joke. And I sat there, and I was shocked because I my concept of what lawyers were they wouldn't be ha they wouldn't have a dirty joke in in their vocabulary. I, you know, I'm whatever I'm, what at that age I'm 22 or 23. Of course, I'd heard dirty jokes before, but uh, it was uh, uh, it, it was a shocker at the time. And uh, then I so I, I just you know I just, just had to start. And, and he's you know he's laughing about it, and you know, it was funny. And then his secretary, sometime after that, had said, um, um, Corey, you, uh, she, she said, I think um, this might not be the profession that you should go into. And I said, well, why is that? And, and she said, you're too nice to be a lawyer. And I started thinking at the time, I was thinking, what do you? What is niceness? I mean, isn't everybody nice? Of course not. I had didn't know any lawyers before then. I hadn't watched lawyers, and you know, you watch the TV shows, Perry Mason and all that, but you have no idea uh, of of what that is. And so, um, I think of those people as this as my progression came along, because then eventually, in you know, I had the same similar issues then in law school when you start going off into internships. Um, there's uh, I remember being at the U.S. Attorney's Office. This, this was up in Sacramento, and uh, w one of the uh, the guy who headed the program, and he's kind of a famous guy. I'm not going to drop names or anything, <laughs> especially I don't want to say anything in case <laughs> all of a sudden someone's knocking on my door or whatever. But uh, I remember at, at one time I was in this group where we were actually prosecuting uh, infractions or you know, something that happened in the forest, uh, you know, in uh, throughout the state or the Eastern District. And uh, I remember one time he said, hey, uh, Corey, he said, we don't think that uh, uh, trials is where your strong suit is going to be. We're going to move you over here and where you're going to do motions and, and writing. And I remember at the time thinking, my gosh, you know what, you know, I, I keep hearing these things as you, uh, as I've went through and and I suppose if I was smarter at the time, maybe not as naive, I'd say, wow, maybe I should be looking you know, for something else. But eventually, um, um, I didn't take it, I guess, to heart that well. At the time, I just said, yeah, this is what I want to do, and I'll, I'll keep on doing it. So I could remember those three people that were instrumental, at least, in, in, in how things proceeded. Once I got into the actual practice of law, there was a, a judge, he's retired now, Judge uh, Charles McNett, 
uh, he was a man who, he is a very nice man. He was one, the exact type of person that I always thought a judge could be, should be, very cordial and courteous to everybody. And I just remember watching him as a, as a developing lawyer saying, you know, he, he's a, uh, that, that's a man who, who, who can be a role model. Okay. Thank yeah. you. We're going to take a little bit of a break here. And uh, this is James Berger with Off the Press. Uh, we'll be back with Judge Corey Woodward in just a minute. 